everyone, I'm Wayne Dowson from Wayne Dowson Fine Art and this is my latest Anzac painting. It's Airman Keith Bowley. In part one of Keith's story we heard how one day he's on parade in Sydney. Three hours later he's on a ship sailing for England. Now in part two we pick up Keith's story where he's been posted with the 429th Royal Canadian Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Keith Bowley. Then they sent us to the squadron, 429 squadron. I got this flight commander first. He said, oh, yeah, you'll, 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 you'll do. You can come with me. We're going somewhere tonight. Who the hell was it? One of the German targets. And then we went off with him. I was his second pilot. I sat beside him and looked out the window. We got over the target and bombed the target and then got attacked by a Messerschmitt 210. We dodged him and came back. The next night, the wing commander, flight commander, he said, oh, you can come with me now. <laughs> so I went and did the same thing with him, went to Mannheim and uh, got attacked by a Messerschmitt 410 after bombing. And the next night we went back and they said, oh, you, you can take your own crew now. So uh, they gave me a Halifax, my crew. This is after my vast experience, two trips. We went to Hanover again. First trip was to Hanover. So we went to Hanover again and got attacked by a missionary. 210. And he uh, hit the aircraft with about well, half a dozen cannon shells and a few machine gun things. We went through the uh, down from the controls up the front uh, down to the rudder on the tail. It was uh, tubular aluminium things running through through uh, brackets. Anyhow, I was, uh, this uh, something went wrong and the lumen thing stuck. Uh, it's only do this thing, the main control. Anyhow, I got Paddy, the Irish wireless uh, engineer, Kind of help him. Look, he said, oh, it's cannon shells gone through the, the uh, this uh, aluminium tube. He stuck it in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, okay. what not, in the gauge thing. Uh, so I said, well, take it off and let it fly, run free. Uh, so he did that and it worked quite well for it. Came into land, and I came into land, Got it back here and stopped. So I gave it a great even down on the ground, which is a good landing, I thought, because it stayed there and didn't bust anything. Everyone, everyone was quite happy they got there. Keith, can you tell us how many bombing missions you flew over Europe? 17. 14 over, over Germany and three over France. You spoke about being attacked by fighters, but was there ever any ground flak? Uh, oh, plenty, plenty of ground flak, yeah. Yeah, yeah every time you got over the target, they are banging away at you with 88s, 21,000 feet. Well, if you saw the, saw the smoke, it was all right because it had gone all. You saw the, 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 the flash inside the smoke, it was getting close. Oh. And if you could hear it, it was right in here in the cabin with you. But half the time, if you got shot up, you used to lose one or two motors. If you were unlucky, you lost them both on one side. Right. Then it was hard on your foot. You could hold, hold two motors on one side. Keith, can you tell us about the night you were shot down over Luxembourg? What happened? Well, we... We were poking along, 21,000 feet, 
26 mile. Yeah, 260 mile an hour. And uh, no one saw anything except there was a bang. And uh, the tail gunner screams out, there's a fighter on our tail. But he'd already done the damage, he'd shot us through, come up like that and shot us through the side. Set the port out a motor on fire. Little bit of fire, so I cut the petrol off and put the fire extinguisher on it. And it looked as if it had gone out, started to smoke again, and then it started to catch catch fire. And he he was up, I was down here, and he he was flying up here, looking at me. Otherwise, I, if he'd been down there, I could have slid down into him and cut him in half with it. The good air crews have a good big steel air. It's 14 feet long. It would have cut him in half. I didn't mean one will know. But he's on the wrong side. I couldn't slide down. One, one engine dead on that side and sliding down was on this side. And he was on the top side. Tried watching it. Anyhow, we. He, he, he it caught fire. And the the, the uh, elevators, ailerons, were burning off, and she was turning over, going over like this. So I bailed the four of the crew out. And the two gunners didn't want to go. They said, "You're going to try and fly back, aren't you?" I said, "Yeah." So they said, "We'll stay with you for a while." So they stayed put. And then they started to, to turn over because the ailerons were burnt off, or one aileron on one side. So I said, you better get out and walk. So they came, both came past me and went under, under the navigator's table and through the door there. And I put her on for autopilot, which sort of held her a little bit steady and dashed down there and tail gunner sitting there with his legs and, and uh, hanging out so I put my feet in his shoulders and kicked him out went out after him did three revolutions on the burning aircraft pulled the ripcord looked up, looked down and hit the ground nice muddy ploughed field, potato field it was little potato field in Luxembourg so I buried my parachute in a, what I thought was a heap of rubbish, it wasn't, this was a, a potato clamp full of, full of spuds, which I didn't realise at the time. And I went and camped under a little pine tree, snowing gently, chilly. And then in the morning, I had a sleep there. I listened to the aircraft burning about a mile and a half while they were at hit some trees. And the machine gun bullets going off. I think we hadn't used any up much. We had about 2,000 odd machine gun bullets for the two turrets. And anyhow, the next day I stayed put. Well, I walked down and I found four characters who were working away and make, making hay, stacking hay in a shed. They were Luxembourgers, I think. Anyhow, they, they, I, they pointed me up to, up back to where I was, so I went back there and then at night I walked down to a road, found a sign which said Luxembourg. 12 kilometres, Metz, 33. And I thought, not much point in going to Luxembourg. It's practically in Germany. I didn't know where the hell Metz was, but I thought I'd, I'd walk to Metz and walk through it. Uh, so I walked 33 miles that night. And uh, 
went, out, went out, off the track a few times, had a drink out of a bit of a creek I was running through and, and I was going to sleep, sleep in, a, in someone's shed. They had a couple of dogs there so I gave that away. Anyhow, I came to Metz the next day and there was a female in uniform. I was, I'd taken all my settings off and had my Australian battle dress on which looked very like a, a German youth thing, uniform. So she was going crooked me. So I said, Badong, Badong, Bong Bong. I went for my life. And she didn't say, say anything. She, she thought I was a bit nuts, I think. Then you know, I got out the other side of, of Metz. And I thought, well, if I, there's, a, there's a road here going to Verdun. The only thing in between it and Verdun was a river, the Meuse, or Meuse, I think it was. Anyhow, I got about two miles out of town and I found a, a wood there. I thought well, I could camp here for the day and can walk on at night. And then well, I find that there were a mob of German soldiers with light tanks having a back mock battle across this road. So I thought, that's, a, that's nice. And I walked film. It was a sunken road anyway. I went up to the... I went through a small village and there was a young fellow with a Italy youth band on. He was looking at me, it's a bit funny. He must have rung ahead. There was a bloke, a uh, soldier came down Rifle over his shoulder. Permit, permit, permit. So I thought, oh, bugger him, I go. I've had it. I fished out my dog tags, stuck him under his nose, and he nearly had a fit. Oh, Australian, Australian, terrific! And the two, two ladies coming up with a baby in a pram. Australian, Australian, terrific! And they went for their lives. I was going to murder them. And then they, they, he cast me up to the next village where he came from. And the sergeant there is sitting at the table there with his pistol <laughs> waving around at me. So I just grinned at him. Anyhow, he, uh, they rang up the Gestapo. Send the Gestapo out in a a gas, gas bag covered Mercedes, neither of whom could speak any English. So they carted me into town, no one in there could speak any English into Mets. So they, they bung me off to a, an airfield, I think. They were flying Messerschmitt 190s. And uh, anyhow, I stayed there for a while. Then they gave me two small guards with big, big pistols, put me on a train at Metz that night. In here we went off there, we stayed at Mannheim. We had to, they, they had a, a beer apiece and bought me a cup of horrible coffee and a bit of black bread, which is all right. I hate that. And uh, all the back of the all the back of the uh, railway refreshment room had been knocked off, blown off. So I didn't, it was full of, full of armed men. I didn't tell them that I, I might have been one of the ones who helped knock it and knock it off a week or so before. And he uh, put us back on the train. And uh, the train was packed. Couldn't get anywhere to sit. Put me on a, a seat in the corridor, and there was a girl sitting next to me. So I thought I better demonstrate her, what a rude, crude fellow Australian pilots are. So I stood up, and these two young little fellows grabbed me by the shoulders and shoved me back. Nine, nine. And they, she had to stand up. 
uh, and I wanted to wet. So they opened the door and the old one came and had to watch me. <laughs> then we got to, what was it? Frank was with us. Frank, I suppose it was. Yeah, the next morning. And they stuck us on a, on a tram and took us down to the interrogation place. Put me in a, a room on my own, turned the heater on for the heat, and turned it off for the cold. And then this character interrogated me the next morning. Murderer, you're a murderess of women and children who take the papers in their beds. I said, what would you do it? London and Coventry. Uh, he shut up after that. And then they put us all on a train, two hundred dollars they were, mostly Yanks. I got on a tra uh, 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 train with the wounded and the, the battered ones. Don't know why. A filthy tra train, it was just a, a cattle train with barbed wire across the the windows were what passed for windows. So we tottered off and went up there and went through Berlin in the railway marshalling yard. There wasn't a building standing in Berlin when we went through it. It all been, all been burnt. Then they put us on another train and took us up to Bath, which is on the Baltic, about a hundred miles from Berlin. So we had to march it, march through, march through Bath to Stalag Luft One. They bunged us in there. I think there were thirty of us went into into one. The first room. And the next day, for some reason or other, they put me in a room with six six others. I was there was two Australians. They, what's his name? Re Eason. He was here with me. He came up on the train with me too. Uh, they were pathfinders. They'd been shot down. And uh, I think they were the only two survivors. I was lucky I didn't, didn't lose any of the crew. What was the food like in the POW camp, Keith? We used to get uh, American Red Cross parcels, British Red Cross parcels, and, and uh, Canadian Red Cross parcel. All that different stuff, and you're supposed to get one a week, but you didn't. You see, normally we were six in the room, room to start with, and then eight later on, as they used to shoot down a few more aircraft. So we used to get probably two a month. That used to keep us going. You got all sorts of things in the Red Cross parcels, and you got the German rations, which you you would have starved on. Who liberated you from the camp? The, the Ruskies relieved us. Rokotovsky's forces. We had about a fortnight with them. And they said, oh, we're going to send you walking out of the Black Sea to go home from there. And we said, I get it. Oh, anyhow, that's what the Colonel said. So he got in touch with his, his mates in on the fortresses and the next day they said, right out, pack up everything you can, if you want to take with you and get out to the airfield nearby. There's 400 fortresses lined up around the, around the edge. Keith was on one of those flying fortresses which took him back to England. Thank you Keith for sharing your story and thanks everyone for watching.